Good morning. Hello. I'm going to move my mic here in just a sec. Sorry for any weird noises. Thank you for the host, Caden. I hope you're doing well. Hope that works okay. Uh, as far as music goes. Whoop, that's too much. All right, we're going to try that there. Y'all tell me if music gets too loud at any point. Um, <clears throat> we have four chapters to read, the end of the book, and not a lot of time to do it. So I'm sorry if I am a bit more um, rushed feeling than normal. Um, I just really want to get this book done. Um, and move so we can finish the series because we're getting so close to the end of the series so that being said let me take a sip of my coffee and I think we're gonna just jump right in but it's good to see you guys and I appreciate you being here and for the hosts mm. got some toasted graham coffee to make it through that's pretty much how this is gonna go. Are you ready? Let me move this out of my way so I don't spill it. Okay. We're gonna jump right in. <clears throat> Chapter 10. The way sadness works is one of the strange riddles of the world. If you are stricken with a great sadness, you may feel as if you have been set aflame. Not only because of the enormous pain, but also because your sadness may spread over your life like smoke from an enormous fire. You might find it difficult to see anything but your own sadness, the way smoke can cover a landscape so that all anyone can see is black. You may find that happy things are tainted with sadness, the way smoke leaves its ashen colors and scents on everything it touches. And you may find that if someone pours water all over you, you are damp and distracted, but not cured of your sadness the way a fire department can douse a fire but can never recover what has been burnt down. The Baudelaire orphans, of course, had had a great sadness in their life from the moment they first heard of their parents' death, and sometimes it felt as if they had to wave smoke away from their eyes to see even the happiest of moments. As Violet and Klaus watched Fiona and the hook-handed man embrace one another, they felt as if the smoke of their own unhappiness had filled the brig. They could not bear to think that Fiona had found her long-lost brother when they themselves in all likelihood would never see their parents again, and might even lose their sister as the poisonous spores of the medusoid mycelium made her coughing sound worse and worse inside the helmet. Fiona! the hook-handed man cried. Is it really you? Hi, the mycologist said, taking off her triangular glasses to wipe away her tears. I never thought I would see you again, Fernald. What happened to your hands? Never mind that, the hook-handed man said quickly. Why are you here? Did you join Count Olaf too? Certainly not, Fiona said firmly. He captured the Queequeg and threw us into the brig. 
So you've joined the Baudelaire brats, the hook-handed man said. I should have known you were a goody-goody. I haven't joined the Baudelaire's, Fiona said just as firmly. They've joined me, I. I'm the captain of the Queequeg now. You, said Olaf's henchman. What happened to Wittershins? He disappeared from the submarine, Fiona replied. We don't know where he is. I don't care where he is, the hook-handed man sneered. I, could, I couldn't care less about that mustache fool. He's the reason I joined Count Olaf in the first place. The captain was always shouting, I, 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 and ordering me around. So I ran away and joined Olaf's acting troupe. But Count Olaf is a terrible villain, Fiona cried. He has no regard for other people. He dreams up, he dreams up treacherous schemes and lures others into becoming his cohorts. These are just the bad aspects of him, the hook-handed man said. There are many good parts as well. For instance, he has a wonderful laugh. A wonderful laugh is no excuse for villainous behavior, Fiona said. Let's just agree to disagree, the hook-handed man replied, using a tiresome expression which here means you're probably right, but I'm too embarrassed to admit it. He waved a hook carelessly at his sister. Step aside, Fiona. It's time for the orphans to tell me where the sugar bowl is. Olaf's henchman scraped his hooks together to give them a quick sharpening and took one threatening step toward the Baudelaire's. Violet and Klaus looked at one another in fear and then at the diving helmet where they heard their sister give another shuddering cough and knew it was time to lay their cards on the table, a phrase which here means reveal themselves honestly to Olaf's wicked henchmen. We don't know where the sugar bowl is, Violet said. My sister is telling the truth, Klaus said. Do with us what you will, but we won't be able to tell you anything. The hunk headed man glared at them and scraped his hooks together once more. You're liars, he said. Both of you are rotten, orphan liars. It's true, Fernald, Fiona said. Aye, finding the sugar bowl was the Queequeg's mission, but so far we failed. If you don't know where the sugar bowl is, the hook-headed man said angrily, then putting you in the brig is completely pointless. He turned around and kicked his small stool, toppling it over, and then kicked the wall of the brig for good measure. What am I supposed to do now? He sulked. Fiona put her hand on her brother's hook. Take us back to the Queequeg, she said. Sonny is in that helmet, along with the growth of medusoid mycelium. Medusoid mycelium? Olaf's henchman repeated in horror. That's a very dangerous fungus. She's in great danger, Violet said. If we don't find a cure very soon, she'll die. The hook-handed man frowned, but then looked at the helmet and gave the children a shrug. Why should I care if she dies? He asked. She's made my life miserable from the time I met her. Every time we fail to get the Baudelaire fortune, Count Olaf yells at everyone. You're the one who made the Baudelaire's lives miserable, Fiona said. Count Olaf has performed countless treacherous schemes, and you've helped him time and time again, I. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. The hook-handed man sighed and looked down at the floor of the brig. Sometimes I am, he admitted. Life in Olaf's troop sounded like it was going to be glamorous and fun, but we've ended up doing more murder, arson blackmail and assorted violence than I would have preferred. This is your chance to do something noble, Fiona said. You don't have to remain on the wrong side of the schism. Oh, Fiona, the hook-handed man said and put one hook awkwardly around her shoulder. You don't understand. There is no wrong side of the schism. Of course there is, Klaus said. VFD is a noble organization and Count Olaf is a terrible villain. A noble organization? The hook-handed man said. Is that so? Tell that to your baby sister, you four-eyed fool. If it weren't for volatile fungus deportation, you would have never encountered those deadly mushrooms. The children looked at one another, remembering what they had read in the Gregornian Grotto. They had to admit that Olaf's henchman was right. But Violet reached into her pocket and drew out the newspaper clipping Sunny had found in the cave. She held it out so everyone could see the Daily Punctilio article so that the eldest Baudelaire had kept hidden for so long. Verifying Fernald's defection, she said, reading the headline out loud, and then continued by reading the byline, a word which here means name of the person who wrote the article, by Jacques Snicket. It has now been confirmed that the fire that destroyed Anwhistle Aquatics and took the life of famed ichnologist Gregor Anwhistle was set by Fernald Wintershins, the son of the captain of the Queequeg submarine. The Wittershins family's participation in a recent schism has raised several re questions regarding... Violet looked up and met the glare of Olaf's henchmen. 
The rest of the article is blurry, she said, but the truth is clear. You defected. You abandoned VFD and joined up with Olaf. The difference between the two sides of the schisms, Klaus said, is that one side puts out fires and the other is starting them. The hook-handed man reached forward and speared the article on one of his hooks and then turned the clipping around so he could read it again. You should have seen that fire, he said quietly. From a distance, it looked like an enormous black plume of smoke rising straight out of the water. It was like the sea was burning down. You must have been proud of your handiwork, Fiona said bitterly. Proud, the hook-handed man said. That was the worst day of my life. That plume of smoke was the saddest thing I've ever seen. He speared the newspaper with his other hook and ripped the article into shreds. The punctilio got everything wrong, he said. Captain Wittershins is not my father. Wittershins is not my last name. And there's much more to the fire than that. You should know that the daily punctilio doesn't tell the whole story, Baudelaire's. Just as a poison of a deadly fungus can be the source of some wonderful medicines, someone like Jacques Snicket can do something villainous, and something someone like Count Olaf can do something noble. Even your parents, our stepfather knew Jacques Snicket, Fiona said. He was a good man, but Count Olaf murdered him. Are you a murderer too? Did you kill Gregor and Whistle? In grim silence, the hook-handed man held his hooks in front of the children. The last time you saw me, he said to Fiona, I had two hands instead of hooks. Our stepfather probably didn't tell you what happened to me. He always said there were secrets in this world too terrible for young people to know. What a fool. Our stepfather is not a fool, Fiona said. He is a noble man, I. People aren't either wicked or noble, the hook-handed man said. They're like chef salads with good things and bad things chopped and mixed together in a vinaigrette of confusion and conflict. He turned to the two elder Baudelaire's and pointed at them with his hooks. Look at yourselves, Baudelaire's. Do you really think we're so different? When those eagles carried me away from the mountains in that net, I saw the ruins of that fire in the hinterlands. A fire we started together. You've burned down things, and so have I. You joined the crew of the Queequeg, and I joined the crew of the Carmelita. Our captains are both volatile people, and we're both trying to get to the Hotel de Numont before Thursday. The only difference between us is the portraits on our uniforms. We're wearing Herman Melville, Klaus said. He was a writer of enormous talent who dramatized the plight of overlooked people, such as poor sailors or exploited youngsters, though his strange, often experimental, through his strange, often experimental philosophical prose. I'm proud to display his portrait. But you're wearing Edgar Guest. He was a writer of limited skill who wrote awkward, tedious poetry on hopelessly sentimental topics. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Edgar Guest is not my favorite poet, the hook-handed man admitted. Before I joined up with Count Olaf, I was studying poetry with my stepfather. We used to read to one another in the main hall of the Queequeg, but it's too late now. I can't return to my old life. Maybe not, Klaus said, but you can return us to the Queequeg so we could save Sonny. Please, the, hel the children heard Sonny say from inside the helmet, although her voice was quite hoarse, as if she'd not be able to speak for much longer. And for a moment, the only sound in the brig was Sonny's desperate coughing as the minutes in her crucial hour ticked away and the muttering of the hook-handed man as he paced back and forth, twiddling his hooks in thought. Violet and Klaus watched his hooks and thought of all the times he had used them to threaten the siblings. It is one thing to believe that people have both good and bad inside them, mixed together like ingredients in a salad bowl. But it is quite another to look at a cohort of a despicable villain who has tried again and again to cause so much harm and try to see where the good parts are buried, when all you can remember is the pain and suffering he's caused. As the hook-handed man circled the brig, it was, as, it was as if the Baudelaire's were picking through a chef's salad consisting of mostly dreadful and perhaps even poisonous ingredients and trying desperately to find the one noble crouton that might save their sister, just as I, between paragraphs, am picking through this salad in front of me, hoping that my writer is more noble than wicked and that my sister Kit might be saved by the small herbed piece of toast that I hope to retrieve from my bowl. After much hemming and hawing, however, a phrase which here means muttering and clearing of one's throat, used to avoid making a quick decision, Count Olaf's henchman stopped in front of the children, put his hooks on his hips, and offered them a Hobson's choice. I'll return you to the Queequeg, he said, if you take me with you. End of chapter 10. Let's catch up on Storim, or um, Chet.
There's a lot of oofs going up. All the fun things. Hey Tara, good morning. The Daily Punctilio is a punk. Melville was overrated. Fight me, Klaus. Ooh. Look at them fighting words. Salad this, salad that. I was sort of hungry when writing. Probably. <sighs> Thank you for the claps. And thank you for the host. Mm. There's some... What? Restart to an update to stay in support. I don't want to. I don't want to update my computer. Let's do... Oh, I don't know. Friday morning be at work then. That's good. Oh, that's okay, Caden. Welcome back. Oh, I appreciate the host. <laughs> okay. We're just gonna move along. Okay. <clears throat> Chapter 11 I, Fiona said I, I, I will take you with us, Fernald I Violet and Klaus looked at one another They were grateful, of course, that the hook-handed man was letting them save Sunny from the medusoid mycelium But they couldn't help but wish Fiona had uttered fewer eyes Inviting Count Olaf's henchmen to join them on the Queequeg seemed if he was Even if he was Fiona's long-lost brother Seemed like a decision they might regret I'm so glad, the hook-handed man said, giving the two siblings a smile they found inscrutable, a word which here means either pleasant or nasty, but it was hard to tell. I have lots of ideas about where we could go after we get off the Carmelita. Well, I'd certainly like to hear them, Viota said. I? Perhaps we could discuss such things later, Violet said. I don't think now is a good time to hesitate. I, Fiona said. She who hesitates is lost. Or he, Klaus reminded her. We've got to get to the Queequeg right away. The hook-handed man opened the door of the brig and looked up and down the corridor. This'll be tricky, he said, beckoning to the children with one of his hooks. The only way back to the Queequeg is through the rowing room, but that room is filled with children we've kidnapped. Esme took my Tagliatelle Grande and it's whipping them so they'll row faster. The elder Baudelaire's did not bother to point out that the hook-handed man had threatened the Baudelaire's with the very same noodle when the children had worked at Caligari Carnival, along with a few other individuals who had ended up joining Olaf's troop. Is there any way to sneak past them? Violet asked. We'll see, Olaf's henchman said. Follow me. The hook-handed man strode quickly down the empty corridor, with Fiona behind him and the two Baudelaire's behind her carrying the diving helmet in which Sunny still coughed. Violet and Klaus purposely lagged behind so they might have a word with the macologist. Fiona, are you sure you want to take him with us? Klaus asked, leaning in close to murmur in her ear. He's a very dangerous and volatile man. He's my brother, Fiona. But sir, he's our brother, Fiona replied in a fierce whisper. And I'm your captain. I, I'm in charge of the Queequeg, so I get to choose its crew. We know that, Violet said. But we thought you might want to reconsider. Never, Fiona said firmly. With my stepfather gone, Fernald may be the only person I have left in my family. Would you ask me to abandon my own sibling? As if replying, Sunny coughed desperately from inside her helmet, and the elder Baudelaire's knew that Fiona was right. Of course we wouldn't, Klaus said. Stop muttering back there, the hook-handed man ordered as he led the children around another twist in the corridor. We're approaching the rowing room, and we don't want anyone to hear us. The children stopped talking, but as the henchman stopped at the door to the rowing room and held his hook over an eye on the wall which would open the door, Violet and Klaus could hear that there was no reason to be quiet. Even through the thick metal of the rowing room entrance, they could hear the loud, piercing voice of Carmelita Spatz. For my third dance, she was saying, I will twirl around and around while all of you clap as hard as you can. It's a dance of celebration in honor of the most adorable tap-dancing ballerina fairy princess veterinarian in the world. Please, Carmelita, begged the voice of a child. We've been rowing for hours. Our hands are too sore to clap. 
there was a faint, damp sound like someone dropping a washcloth, and the elder Baudelaire's realized that Esme was whipping the children with her enormous noodle. <laughs> you will participate in Carmelita's recital, the treacherous girlfriend announced, or you will suffer the sting of my tagliatelle grande. Ha <laughs> ha, hoity-toity. It's not really a sting, said one brave child. It's more of a mild, wet slap. Shut up, cake sniffer! Carmelita ordered, and the children heard the rustle of her pink tutu as she began to twirl. Start clapping, she shrieked, and then the children heard a sound they had never heard before. There is nothing wicked about having a dreadful singing voice, any more than there is something wicked about having dreadful posture, dreadful cousins, or a dreadful pair of pants. Many noble and pleasant people have any number of these things, and there are even one or two kind individuals who have them all. But if you have something dreadful and you force it upon someone else, then you have done something quite wicked indeed. If you force your wicked posture on someone, for instance, by leaning so far back they are forced to carry you down the street, then you have wickedly ruined their afternoon walk. And if you force your dreadful cousins on someone by dropping them off to play at their house so you can escape from their dreadful presences and spend some time alone, then you have wickedly ruined their entire day. And only a very wicked person indeed would force a dreadful pair of pants on the legs and lower torso, torso of somebody else. But to force your dreadful singing voice on somebody or even a crowd of people is one of the world's most wicked crimes. And at that moment, Carmelita Spatz opened her mouth and afflicted the crew of the Carmelita with her wickedness. <laughs> Carmelita's singing voice was loud, like a siren and high-pitched, like a squeaky door, and extremely off-pitch, as if all the notes in the musical scale were pushing up against one another, all trying to sound at the same time. Her singing voice was mushy, as if someone had filled her mouth with mashed potatoes before she sang, and filled with vibrato, which is the Italian term for a voice that wavers as it sings, as if someone were shaking Carmelita very vigorously as she began her song. Even the most dreadful of voices can be tolerated if it is performing a good song, but I'm sad to say that Carmelita Spatz had written the song herself, and that it was just as dreadful as her singing voice. Violet and Klaus were reminded of Prufrock Preparatory School where they first met Carmelita. The vice principal of the school, a tedious man named Nero, forced his students to listen to him play the violin for hours, and they realized this administrator must have had a powerful influence on Carmelita's creativity. C is for cute, Carmelita sang. A is for adorable. R is for ravishing. M is for gorgeous. E is for excellent. L is for lovable. I is for I'm the best. T is for talented. And A is for a tap dancing ballerina fairy princess veterinarian. Now let's begin my whole wonderful song all over again! The song was so irritating, and sung so poorly, that Violet and Klaus almost felt as if they were being tortured after all, particularly as Carmelita kept on singing it, over and over and over. I cannot stand her voice, Violet said. It reminds me of the cawing of the VFD crows. I cannot stand those lyrics, Klaus said. Someone does not need to... Someone needs to tell her that gorgeous does not begin with the letter M. I can't stand the brat, the hook-handed man said bitterly. She's one of the reasons I'd like to leave. But this sounds like as good a time as any to try to sneak through this room. There are plenty of pillars to hide behind, and if we walk around the very edge, where each oar sticks through the wall into the tentacles of the octopus, we should be able to get to the other door. Assuming everybody is watching Carmelita's tap-dancing ballerina fairy princess veterinarian dance recital. This seems like a very risky plan. Violet said. This is no time to be a coward, the hook-handed man growled. My sister is not a coward, Klaus said. She's just being cautious. There's no time to be cautious, Fiona said. I, she who hesitates is lost. I, or he. Let's go. Without another word, <clears throat> the hook-handed man poked the eye on the wall and the door slid open to reveal the enormous room. As Olaf's comrade had predicted, the rowing children were all facing Carmelita, who was prancing and singing on one side of the room, while Esme watched with a proud smile on her face and a large noodle in one of her tentacles. With the hook-handed man and Fiona in the lead, the three Baudelaire's, Sunny still in the diving helmet, of course, made their careful way around the outside of the room as Carmelita twirled around singing her absurd song. When Carmelita announced what C was for, the children ducked behind one of the pillars. 
When she told her listeners the meaning of A and R, the children crept past the moving oars, taking care not to trip. When she insisted that gorgeous began with M, Count Olaf's henchmen pointed one of his hooks at a far door, and when Carmelita reached E and L, the children ducked behind another pillar, hoping the dim light of the lanterns would not give them away. When Carmelita announced that she was the best and bragged about being talented, Esme Squalor frowned and turned around, blinking underneath the fake eyes of her octopus outfit, and the children had to flatten themselves on the floor so the villainous girlfriend would not spot them. And when the tap-dancing ballerina fairy princess veterinarian found it necessary to remind her audience that she was, in fact, a tap-dancing ballerina fairy princess veterinarian, the two elder Baudelaire's found themselves ahead of Fiona and the hook-handed man, hiding behind a pillar that was just a few feet from their destination. They were just about to inch their way toward the door when Carmelita began belting out the last line of her song. Belting out is a phrase which here means singing in a particularly loud and particularly irritating voice, only to stop herself as she was about to begin her whole wonderful song all over again. C is for cake sniffers, she shouted. What are you doing here? Violet and Klaus froze and then saw with relief that the terrible little girl was pointing scornfully at Fiona and the hook-handed man who were standing awkwardly between two oars. "'How dare you, Hookie?' Esme said, fingering her large noodle as if she wanted to strike him with it. "'You're interrupting a, vi a very in recital by an unspeakably darling little girl!' "'I'm very sorry, your Esme-ness,' the hook-handed man said, stepping forward to elaborately bow in front of the wicked girlfriend. "'I would sooner lose both hands all over again than interrupt Carmelita when she's dancing.' But you did interrupt me, you handicapped snake cake, <laughs> cake sniffer. <laughs> Carmelita pouted. Now I have to start the entire recital all over again. No, cried one of the rowing children. Anything but that, it's torture. Speaking of torture, the hook-handed man said quickly, I stopped by to see if I could borrow your tagliatelle grande. It'll help me get the Baudelaire's to reveal the location of the sugar bowl. Esme frowned and fingered the noodle with one tentacle. I don't really like to lend things, she said. It usually leads to people messing up my things. Please, ma'am, Fiona said. We're so close to learning the location of the sugar bowl, I. We just need to borrow your noodle so we can return to the brig. Why are you helping, Hooky? Esme said. I thought you were another goody-goody orphan. Certainly not, the hook-handed man said. This is my sister, Fiona, and she's joining the crew of the Carmelita. Fiona isn't a very in name, Esme said. I think I'll call her Triangle Eyes. Are you really willing to join us, Triangle Eyes? Aye, Fiona said. Those Baudelaire's are nothing but trouble. Why are you still talking? demanded Carmelita. This is supposed to be my special tap dancing ballerina fairy princess veterinarian dance recital time. Sorry, darling, Esme said. Hooky and Triangle Eyes, take this noodle and scram. The hook-handed man and his sister walked to the center of the room and stood directly in front of Esme and Carmelita, offering a perfect opportunity for the elder Baudelaire's to scram, a rude word which here means slip out of the room unnoticed and walk down the shadowy hallway Olaf had led them down just a little while earlier. "'Do you think Fiona will join us?' Violet asked. "'I don't think so,' Klaus said. "'They told Esme they'd return to the brig, so they'll have to go back the way we came.' "'You don't really think she's joining Olaf's troop, do you?' Olaf said. "'Of course not.' Violet said. Of course not, Klaus said. That was just to give us an opportunity to get out of the room. Fiona may be volatile, but she's not that volatile. Of course not, Violet said, although she didn't sound very sure. Of course not, Klaus repeated as another ragged cough came from inside the diving helmet. Hang on, Sonny, he called to his sister. You'll be cured in no time. Although he tried to sound as confident as he could, the middle Baudelaire had no way of knowing if his words were true, although I'm happy to say they were. How are you going to cure Sunny? Violet said, without Fiona. We'll have to research ourselves, Klaus said firmly. We'll never read her entire mycological library in time to make an antidote, Violet said. We don't have to read the entire library, Klaus said as they reached the door to the Queequeg's brig. I know just where to look. Sunny coughed again and then began to wheeze, a word which here means make a hoarse whistling sound, indicating that her throat was almost completely closed up. <clears throat> The elder Baudelaire's could hardly stop themselves from opening the helmet to comfort their sister, but they didn't want to risk getting poisoned themselves. I hope you're right, Violet said, pressing a metal eye on the wall. The door slid open and children hurried toward the broken porthole of the submarine. Sunny's hour must be almost up. Klaus nodded grimly and jumped through the porthole onto, onto the large wooden table. 
Although it had only been a short while since the children had left the Queequeg, the main hall felt as if it had been abandoned for years. The three balloons tied to the table legs were beginning to sag, the title charts Klaus had studied had fallen to the floor, and the glass circle Count Olaf had cut in the porthole lay still on the floor. But the middle Baudelaire ignored all of these objects and picked up mushroom minute from the floor. This book should have the information on the antidote, he said, and turned immediately to the contents, table of contents, as Violet carried Sunny through the porthole into the submarine. Chapter 36, The Yeast of Beasts. Chapter 37, Moral Behavior in a Free Society. Chapter 38, Fungible Mold, Moldable Fungi. Chapter 39, Visitable Fungal Ditches. Chapter 40, The Gregorian Grotto. That's it, Violet said. Chapter 40. Klaus flipped pages as Sunny gave another desperate wheeze, although I wish the middle Baudelaire could have had the time to return to some of those pages he flipped past. The Gregorian Grotto, he read, located in propiquity to Anne Whistle Aquatics, has a pro appropriately wraith-like nomenclature. We know all that, Violet said hurriedly. Skip to the part about the mycelium. Klaus's eyes scanned the page easily, having had much practice in skipping the parts of books he found less than helpful. The Medusa mycelium has a unique conducive strategy of waxing and waning, interrupted Violet as Sunny's wheezing continued to wax. Skip to the part about the poison. As the poet says, Klaus read, a single spore has such grim power you may die within the hour. Is dilution simple, but of course, just one small dose of root of horse. Root of horse? Violet repeated. How can a horse have a root? I don't know, Klaus said. Usually antidotes are certain botanical extractions, like pollen from a flower or the stem of a plant. Does dilution mean the same thing as antidote? Violet asked, but before her brother could answer, Sunny wheezed again, and the diving helmet rocked back and forth as she struggled against the fungus. Klaus looked at the book he was holding, and then at his sister, and then reached into the waterproof pocket of his uniform. "'What are you doing?' Violet asked. "'Getting my commonplace book,' Klaus replied. "'I wrote down all the information on the history of Anne Whistle Aquatics that we found in the grotto.' "'We don't have time to look for at your research!' Violet said. "'We need to find an antidote this very minute. Fiona's right. He or she who hesitates is lost!' Klaus shook his head. "'Not necessarily,' he said, and flipped a page of his dark blue notebook." If we take a moment to think, we might save our sister. What did Kit Snicket write in that letter? Here it is. The poisonous fungus you insist on cultivating in the grotto will bring grim consequences for all of us. Our factory at Lousy Lane can provi provide some dilution of the mycelium's destructive respiratory capabilities. That's it. VFD was making something in a factory near Lousy Lane that could dilute the effects of the mycelium. Lousy Lane, Violet said, that's the road to Uncle Monty's house. It had a terrible smell, remember? It smelled like black pepper. No, not black pepper. Klaus looked at his commonplace book and then at Mushroom Minute. Horseradish, he said quietly. The road smelled like horseradish. Root of horse. Horseradish is the antidote. Violet was already striding to the kitchen. Let's hope Phil likes to cook with horseradish, she said, and pushed open the door. Klaus picked up the wheezing helmet and followed her into the tiny kitchen. There was scarcely enough room for the children to stand in the small space between the stove, the refrigerator, and two wooden cabinets. The cabinets must serve as a pantry, Klaus said, using a word which here means place where antidotes are hopefully stored. Horseradish should be there if he has it. The elder Baudelaire shuddered, not wanting to think about what would happen to Sunny if horseradish were not found on the shelves. Within moments, however, Violet and Klaus had to consider that very thing. Violet opened one cupboard, and Klaus opened another, and, but the children saw immediately that there was no horseradish. Gum? Violet said faintly. Boxes and boxes of gum Phil brought from the lumber mill and nothing else. Did you find anything, Klaus? Klaus pointed to a pair of small cans on one shelf of his cupboard and held up a small paper bag. Two cans of water chestnuts, he said, and a small bag of sesame seeds. His fist closed tightly around the bag and he blinked back tears behind his glasses. What are we going to do? Sunny wheezed once more, a frantic whistle that reminded her siblings of a train's, lo train's lonely noise as it disappears into a tunnel. Let's check the refrigerator, Violet said. Maybe there's horseradish in there? Klaus nodded and opened the kitchen's refrigerator, which was almost as bare as the pantry. On the top shelf were six small bottles of lemon-lime soda, which Phil had offered the children on their first night aboard the Queequeg. On the middle shelf was a small piece of white soft cheese wrapped up in a bit of wax paper. And on the bottom shelf was a large plate, on which was something that made the two siblings begin to cry. I forgot, Violet said, tears running down her face. 
Me too, Klaus said, taking the plate out of the refrigerator. Phil had used the last of the kitchen's provisions, a word which here means cooking supplies, to prepare a cake. It looked like a coconut cream cake like Dr. Montgomery used to make, and the two siblings wondered if Sonny, even as a baby, had noticed enough about cooking to help Phil concoct such a dessert. The cake was heavily frosted with bits of coconut mixed into the thick creamy frosting and spelled out in blue frosting on the top in Phil's perky, optimistic handwriting were three words. Violet's 15th date, Violet Klaus said numbly. That's what the balloons were for. It was my 15th birthday, Violet said. I turned 15 sometime when we were in the grotto and I forgot all about that. Sunny didn't forget, Klaus said. She said she was going to plan a surprise, remember? We were going to return from our mission in the cave and celebrate your birthday. Violet slunk to the floor and lay her head against Sunny's diving helmet. What are we going to do? She sobbed. We can't lose Sunny. We can't lose her. There must be something we could use, Klaus said. As a substitute for horseradish, what could that be? I don't know, Violet cried. I don't know anything about cooking. Neither do I, Klaus said, crying as hard as his sister. Sunny's the one who knows. The two weeping Baudelaire's looked at one another and then steeled themselves, a phrase which here means summoned up as much strength as they could. Then without another word, they opened the tiny door of Sunny's helmet and quickly dragged their sister out, quickly shutting the door behind her so the fungus would not spread. At first, their sister looked completely unchanged, but when the wheezing young girl opened her mouth, they could see several gray stalks and caps of this horrible mushroom splotched with black as if someone had poured ink into Sunny's mouth. Wheezing horribly, Sunny reached out her tiny arms to each of her siblings and grabbed their hands. She did not have to utter a word. Violet and Klaus knew she was begging for help, but there was nothing they could do except ask her one desperate question. Sunny, Violet said, we've researched an antidote. Only horseradish can save you, but there's no horseradish in the kitchen. Sunny, Klaus said, is there a culinary equivalent of horseradish? Sunny opened her mouth as if trying to say something, but the elder Baudelaire's heard only the hoarse whistling sound of air trying to make its way past the mushrooms. Her tiny hands curled into fists and her body twisted back and forth in pain and fear. Finally, she managed to utter one word, a word that many might not have understood. Some might have thought it was a part of Sunny's personal vocabulary, perhaps her way of saying I love you or even farewell siblings. Some might have thought it was pure nonsense, just the noises one might make when a deadly fungus has defeated you. But there are many others who would have understood it immediately. A person from Japan would have known she was talking about a condiment often served with raw fish and pickled ginger. A chef would have known that Sunny was referring to a strong green root, widely considered the culinary equivalent of horseradish. And Violet and Klaus knew that their sister was naming her salvation, a phrase which here means something that would save her life or something that would rescue her from the medusoid mycelium, or most importantly, an item the eldest Baudelaire still had in the waterproof pocket of her uniform, sealed in a tin Sunny had found in an underwater cavern. Wasabi, Sunny said in a hoarse mushroom-choked whisper, and she did not have to say anything more. It's the end of chapter 11. Children, we I mean borrowed, which we I mean persuaded. Carmelita with her dance claims sounding like V. Carmelita's finally being different than V as Carmelita's vocally trained. <laughs> Rain makes scorn. We have a lot in common. Call me sometime Carmelili. I'll probably forget. More, more just doesn't start with an M. All these years wrong. Snick it, you've got a word minimum you've got to reach. I got this. Gonna describe what Carmelita is multiple times. Olaf is just a tad mean. Just a tad. Hey, A Rocks. Oh, nice. A Rocks, congrats. Oh, man. I would win it all and then lose it all really fast. How come you didn't read that book on the alternatives of horseradish that you received for your nine and a half, half, <laughs> your half the birthday? 
Hello, Moocher. Thank you for the claps. Hello, Paige. Be safe driving. All the noodle talk just bringing back memories of Tangelsa. Yeah, Esme is slapping them with her spaghetti. <laughs> Give me just a moment, please. I'm gonna slap <laughs> with the spaghetti. Okay. Thank you for the schlappa. <laughs> okay, I am going to continue on. We've got two more chapters till the end of the book. <clears throat> Let me see how many pages that is. About 70 pages to go. We can do this, though. <clears throat> Making good time, so. Moving along. Chapter 12. The expression, the tables have turned, is not one the Baudelaire orphans have had much occasion to use, as it refers to a situation that has suddenly been reversed, so that those who were previously in a powerless position could suddenly find themselves in a powerful one, and vice versa. For the Baudelaire's, the tables had turned at Briny Beach when they received news of the terrible fire, and Count Olaf suddenly became a powerful and terrifying figure in their lives. As time went on, the siblings waited and waited for the tables to turn back, so that Olaf might be defeated once and for all, and they could find themselves free of the sinister and mysterious forces that threatened to engulf them. But the tables of the Baudelaire's lives seemed stuck, with the children always in a position of misery and sorrow, while wickedness seemed to triumph all around them. But as Violet hurriedly opened the tin of wasabi she'd been keeping in her pocket and spooned the green, spicy mixture into Sunny's wheezing mouth, it seemed like the tables might turn after all. Sunny gasped when the wasabi hit her tongue, and the stalks and caps of the medusoid mycelium shivered and seemed to shrink back from the powerful Japanese condiment. In moments, the fungus began to wither and fade away, and Sunny's wheezing faded into coughing, and her coughing faded into deep breaths as the youngest Baudelaire rallied a word which here means regained her strength and ability to breathe. The youngest Baudelaire hung on tight to her sibling's hands and her eyes filled with tears, but Violet and Klaus could see that the medusoid mycelium would not triumph over their sister. It's working, Violet said. Sunny's breathing's getting stronger. Yes, Klaus said. We've turned the tables on that ghastly fungus. Water, Sunny said, and her brother stood up from the kitchen floor and quickly got his sister a glass of water. Weakly, the youngest Baudelaire sat up and drank deeply from the glass, then she hugged both her siblings as tightly as she could. Thank you, she said. Saved me. You saved yourself, Violet pointed out. We had the wasabi this whole time, but we didn't think of giving it to you till you told us. Sunny coughed again and lay back down on the floor. Tuckered, she murmured. I'm not surprised you're exhausted, Violet said. You've been through quite an ordeal. Shall we carry you to the barracks so you can rest? Rest here, Sunny said, curling up at the foot of the stove. Will you really be comfortable on the kitchen floor? Klaus asked. Sunny opened one exhausted eye and smiled at her siblings. Near you, she said. All right, Sunny, Violet said, grabbing a dish towel from the kitchen counter and folding it into a pillow for her sister. We'll be in the main hall if you need us. What next? She murmured. Shh, Klaus said, putting another dish towel on top of her. Don't worry, Sunny, we'll figure out what to do next. The Baudelaire's tiptoed out of the kitchen, carrying the tin of wasabi. Do you think she'll be all right? Violet asked. I'm sure she will, Klaus said. After a nap, she'll be as good as new. But we should eat some of that wasabi ourselves. When we opened the diving helmet, we were exposed to the medusoid mycelium, and we'll need all of our strength to get away from Olaf. Violet nodded and put a spoonful of wasabi into her mouth, shuddering violently as the condiment hit her tongue. There's one last spoonful, Violet said, handing the tin to her brother. We'd better make sure that diving helmet stays closed until we get our hands on some horseradish and destroy that fungus for good. Klaus nodded in agreement, closed his eyes, and ate the last of the Japanese condiment. <clears throat> if we ever invent that food code we talked about with Fiona, 
he said, the word wasabi should mean powerful. No wonder this cured our sister. But now that we've cured her, Violet said, remembering Sunny's question as she fell asleep. What's next? Olaf is next, Klaus said firmly. He said he has everything he needs to defeat VFD forever, except the sugar bowl. You're right, Violet said. We have to turn the tables on him and find it before he does. But we don't know where it is, Klaus said. Someone must have taken it from the Gorgonian Grotto. I wonder, Violet said, but she never said what she wondered, because a strange noise interrupted her. The noise was a sort of whir, followed by a sort of beep, followed by all sorts of noises, and they seemed to be coming from deep within the machinery of the Queequeg. Finally, a green light lit up on a panel in the wall, and a flat white object began to slither out of a tiny slit in the panel. It's paper, Klaus said. It's more than paper, Violet said, and walked over to the panel. The sheet of paper curled into her hand as it emerged from the slit, as if the machine were impatient for the eldest Baudelaire to read it. This is the telegram device. We must be receiving a volunteer factual dispatch, Klaus finished. Violet nodded and scanned the paper quickly. Sure enough, the words volunteer factual dispatch were printed at the top, and as more and more of the paper appeared, the eldest Baudelaire saw that it was addressed to the Queequeg with the date printed below, as well as the name of the person who was sending the telegram, miles and miles away on dry land. It was a name Violet almost dared not say aloud, even though it felt as if she'd been whispering it to herself for days. <coughs> 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 Ever since the icy waters of the stricken stream had carried away a young man who meant very much to her. It's from Quigley Quagmire, she said quietly. Klaus's eyes widened in astonishment. What does he say? he asked. Violet smiled as the telegram finished printing, her finger touching the cue in her friend's name. It was almost as if knowing that Quigley was alive was enough of a message. It is my understanding that you have three additional volunteers on board. Stop. She read, remembering that stop indicates the end of a sentence in a telegram. We are in desperate need of their services for a most urgent matter. Stop. Please deliver them Tuesday to the location indicated in the rhymes below. Stop. She scanned the paper and frowned thoughtfully. Then there are two poems, she said, one by Lewis Carroll and the other by T.S. Eliot. Klaus took his commonplace book out of his pocket and flipped pages until he found what he was looking for. Verse fluctuation declaration, he said. That's the code we learned in the grotto. Quigley must have changed some of the words in the poem so no one else would know where we're supposed to meet him. Let's see if we can recognize the changes. Violet nodded and read the first poem out loud. Oi oh, oysters come and walk with us, the walrus did beseech. A pleasant walk, a pleasant talk along the movie theater. Well, that last part sounds wrong, Violet said. There were no movie theaters when Lewis Carroll was alive, Klaus said. But what are the real words to the poem? I don't know. Violet said, I've always found Lewis Carroll too whimsical for my taste. I like him, Klaus said, but I haven't memorized his poems. Read the other one, maybe that'll help. Violet nodded and read aloud. At the pink hour when the eyes and back turn upward from the desk, when the human engine awaits, like a pony throbbing party. The voice of the eldest Baudelaire trailed off and she looked at her brother in confusion. That's all, she said, the poem stops there. Klaus frowned. There's nothing else in the telegram? Only a few letters at the very bottom, she said. C-C-J-S. What does that mean? C-C means that Quigley sent a copy of this message to someone else, Klaus said. And J-S are the initials of the person. Those mysterious initials again, Violet said. It can't be Jacques Snicket because he's dead, but who else could it be? We can't worry about that now, Klaus said. We have to figure out what words have been substituted in these poems. How can we do that? Kla Violet asked. I don't know, Klaus said. Why would Quigley think that we would have memorized these poems? He wouldn't think that, Violet said. He knows us, but the telegram was addressed to the Queequeg. He knew that someone on board could decode the poetry. But who? Klaus asked. Not Fiona, she's a mycologist. An optimist like Phil isn't likely to be familiar with T.S. Eliot, and it's hard to imagine Captain Wittershins having a serious interest in poetry. Not anymore, Violet said thoughtfully. Fiona's brother said he and the captain used to study poetry together. That's true, Klaus said. He said they used to read to one another in the main hall. He walked over to the sideboard and opened the cabinet, peering at the books Fiona kept inside. But there's no poetry here, just Fiona's mycological library. Captain Wittershins wouldn't keep poetry books out front like that, Violet said. He would have kept them secret. Just like he kept the secret of what happened to Fiona's brother, Klaus said. 
He thought they were secrets too terrible for young people to know, Violet said, but now we need to know them. Klaus was silent for a moment and then turned to his sister. There's something I never told you, he said. Do you remember when our parents were so angry over that spoiled atlas? Yeah, we talked about that in the grotto, Violet said. The rain spoiled it when we left the library window open. I don't think that was the only reason they were mad, Klaus said. I took that atlas down from the top shelf, one I could only reach by putting the stepladder on top of the chair. They didn't think I could reach that shelf. Why would that make them angry? Violet asked. Klaus looked down. That's where they kept the books they didn't want us to find, he said. I was interested in the atlas, but when I removed it from the shelf, there was a whole row of other books. What kind of books? Violet asked. I didn't get a good look at them, Klaus asked. There were a f I didn't get a good look at them, Klaus said. There were a few books about war, and I think a few romances. I was too interested in the atlas to investigate any further, but I remember thinking it was strange that our parents had hidden those books. That's why they were so angry, I think. When they saw the atlas on the window seat, they knew I'd discovered their secret. Did you ever look at them again? Violet said. I didn't have a chance, Klaus said. They moved them to another hiding place, and I never saw them again. Maybe our parents were going to tell us what was in those books when we were older, Violet said. Maybe, Klaus agreed, but we'll never know. We lost them in the fire. The elder Baudelaire sat quietly for a moment, looking at the cabinet in the sideboard, and then without a word, the two siblings stepped onto the wooden table so they could open the highest cabinet. Inside was a small stack of books on such dull topics as child-rearing, proper and improper diets, and the water cycle. But when the children pushed these books aside, they saw what they had been looking for. Elizabeth Bishop, Violet said, Charles Simic, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Franz Wright, Daphne Gottlieb, there's all sorts of poetry here. Why don't you read T.S. Eliot, Klaus suggested, handing her a thick, dusty volume, and I'll tackle Lewis Carroll. If we read quickly, we should be able to find the real poems and decode the message. I found something else, Violet said, handing her brother a crumpled square of paper. Look. Klaus looked at what his sister had given him. It was a photograph, blurred and faded with age, of four people, grouped together like a family. In the center of the photograph was a large man with a long mustache that was curved at the end like a pair of parentheses, Captain Wittershins, of course, although he looked much younger and a great deal happier than the children had ever seen him. He was laughing, and his arm was around someone the two Baudelaire's recognized as the hook-handed man, although he was not hook-handed in the photograph. Both of his hands were perfectly intact, one resting on the captain's shoulder and the other pointing at whoever was taking the picture, and he was young enough to still be called a teenager instead of a man. On the other side of the captain was a woman who was laughing as hard as the captain, and in her arms was a young infant with a tiny set of triangular glasses. That must be Fiona's mother, Klaus said, pointing at the laughing woman. Look, Violet said, pointing to the wall behind the family. This was taken on board the Queequeg. That's the edge of the plaque with the captain's first personal philosophy, he who hesitates is lost. The whole family is lost, almost, Klaus said quietly. Fiona's mother's dead. Her brother joined Count Olaf's troop, and who knows where her stepfather is? He put down the photograph, opened his commonplace book, and flipped to the beginning where he had pasted another photograph taken long ago. This photograph also had four people in it, although one of the people was facing away from the camera, so it was impossible to tell who it was. The second person was Jacques Snicket, who of course was long dead. And the other two people were the Baudelaire parents. Klaus had kept this photograph ever since the children found it at Heimlich Hospital and had looked at it every day, gazing into his parents', face, parents faces and reading the one sentence over and over that had been typed below it. Because of the evidence discussed on page 9, the sentence read, Experts now suspect that there may in fact be one survivor of the fire, but the survivor's whereabouts are unknown. For quite some time the Baudelaire's had thought this meant one of their parents was alive after all, but now they were almost certain it meant no such thing. Violet and Klaus looked from one photograph to the other, imagining a time when no one in the pictures was lost and everyone was happy. Klaus sighed and looked at his sister. Maybe we shouldn't be hesitating here, Klaus said. Maybe we should be rescuing our captain instead of reading books of poetry and looking at old photographs. I don't want to lose Fiona. Fiona's safe with her brother, Violet said, and I'm sure she'll join us when she can. We need to decode this message or we might lose everything. In this case, he or she who doesn't hesitate is lost. What if we decode the message before Fiona arrives? Klaus asked. Do we wait for her to join us? 
We wouldn't have to, Violet said. The three of us could properly operate this submarine by ourselves. All we'd need to do is repair the porthole and we could probably steer the Queequeg out of the Carmelita. We can't abandon her here, Klaus said. She wouldn't abandon us. Are you sure? Violet asked. Klaus sighed and looked at the photograph again. No, he said. Let's get to work. Violet nodded in agreement and the two Baudelaire's shelved the discussion, a phrase which here means temporarily stopped their conversation, and unshelved the poetry books in order to get to work on decoding Quigley's verse fluctuation declarations. It had been some time since the Baudelaire's had been able to read in a comfortable place, and the children were pleased to find themselves silently flipping pages, searching for certain words, and even taking a few notes. Reading poetry, even if you are only reading to find a secret message hidden within its words, can often give one a feeling of power, the way you can feel powerful if you are the only one who brought an umbrella on a rainy day, or the only one who knows how to untie knots when you're taken hostage. With each poem, the children felt more and more powerful, or as they might have said in their food code, more and more wasabi. And by the time the two volunteers were interrupted, they felt as if the tables might just be continuing to turn. "'Snack!' announced a cheerful voice below them, and Violet and Klaus were pleased to see their sister emerging from the kitchen carrying a small plate. "'Sunny!' Violet cried. "'We thought you were asleep!' "'Recoup!' the youngest Baudelaire said, which meant something along the lines of, "'I had a brief nap, and when I woke up I felt well enough to cook something.' "'I am a bit hungry,' Klaus admitted. "'What'd you make us?' "'Amuse bouche!' Sunny said, which meant something like tiny water chestnut sandwiches with a spread of cheese and sesame seeds. They're quite tasty, Violet said, and the three children shared the plate of amuse bouche as the elder Baudelaire's brought Sunny up to speed, a phrase which here means told their sister what had happened while she was suffering inside a diving helmet. <laughs> they told her about the terrible submarine that had swallowed the Queequeg and the terrible villain they encountered inside. They described the hideous circumstances in which the Snow Scouts found themselves and the hideous clothing worn by Esme Squalor and Carmelita Spatz. They told her about the volunteer factual dispatch and the verse fluctuation declarations they were trying to decode. And finally, they told her about the hook-handed man being Fiona's long-lost brother and the possibility that he might join them aboard the Queequeg. Parafito, Sunny said, which meant it would be foolish to trust one of Olaf's henchmen. We don't trust him. Klaus said, not really, but Fiona trusts him and we trust Fiona. Volatile, Sunny said. Yes, Violet admitted, but we don't have much choice. We're in the middle of the ocean and we need to get to the beach, Klaus said and held up a book of Lewis Carroll's poetry. I think I've solved part of the verse fluctuation declaration. Lewis Carroll has a poem called The Walrus and the Carpenter. There was something about a walrus in the telegram, Violet said. Yes, Klaus said. It took me a while to find the specific stanza, but here it is. Quigley wrote, Oh, oysters, come and walk with us, the walrus did beseech. A pleasant walk, a pleasant talk along the movie theater. Yes, Violet said, but what does the actual poem say? Klaus read, Oi, o Oh, oysters, come and walk with us, the walrus did beseech. A pleasant walk, a pleasant talk along the briny beach. Klaus closed the book and looked up at his sisters. Quigley wants us to meet him tomorrow, he said, at Briny Beach. Briny Beach, Violet repeated quietly. The eldest Baudelaire did not have to remind her siblings, of course, of the last time they were at Briny Beach, learning from Mr. Poe that the tables of their lives had turned. The three siblings sat and thought of that terrible day, which felt as blurred and faded as the photograph of Fiona's family, or the photograph of their own parents, pasted into Klaus's commonplace book. Returning to Briny Beach after all this time felt to the Baudelaire's like an enormous step backward, as if they would lose their parents and their home again, and Mr. Poe would take them once more to Count Olaf's house, and all the unfortunate events would crash over them once more, like the waves of the ocean crashing on the tide pools of Briny Beach and the tiny passive creatures who lived inside them. How would we get there? Klaus asked. In the Queequeg, Violet said. The submarine should have a location device, and once we know where we are, I think we could set a course for Briny Beach. Distance? Sunny asked. It shouldn't be far, Klaus said. I'd have to check the charts, but... What would we do when we got there? I think I have the answer to that, Violet said, turning to her book of T.S. Eliot poems. Quigley used lines from a very long poem in this book called The Wasteland. I tried to read that, Klaus said, but I found T.S. Eliot too opaque. I scarcely understood a word. Maybe it's all in code, Violet said. Listen to this. Quigley wrote, At the pink hour, when the eyes and back turn upward from the desk, when the human engine awaits, like a pony-throbbing party... But the real poem reads, At the violet hour, 
when the eyes and back turn upward from the desk, when the human engine awaits, like a blah, 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 ha, 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 interrupted a cruel mocking voice. Ha, blah, ha, ha, blah. Tee hee, sniggle, snaggle, tee hee hee, hubba, hubba, giggle, diddle, denouement. The Baudelaire's looked up from their books to face Count Olaf, who was already stepping through the porthole and onto the wooden table. Behind him was Esme Squalor, sneering beneath the hood of her octopus outfit, and the children could hear the unpleasant slapping footsteps of the horrid pink shoes of Carmelita Spatz, who peeked her heart-decorated face into the submarine and giggled nastily. "'I'm happier than a pig-eating bacon,' Count Olaf cried. "'I'm tickled pinker than a sunburned Caucasian. "'I'm in higher spirits than a brand-new graveyard. "'I'm so happy-go-lucky that lucky and happy people "'are trying to beat me with sticks out of pure unbridled jealousy. "'Ha ha, Jima, Jakama. "'When I stopped by the brig to see how my associate was progressing "'and found how that you orphans had flown the coop, "'I was afraid you were escaping or sabotaging my submarine "'or even sending a telegram asking for help.' But I should have known you were too dim-witted to do anything useful. Look at yourselves, orphans, snacking and reading poetry while the powerful and good-looking people of the world cackle in triumph. Cackle, cackle, cutthroat. In just a few minutes, Esme bragged, we will arrive at the Hotel de Numas, thanks to our bratty rowing crew. Tee-hee, triumphant. VFD's last safe place will soon be in ashes, just like your home, Baudelaire's. I'm going to do a special tap-dancing ballerina fairy princess veterinarian dance recital, Carmelita bragged, on the graves of all those volunteers. Carmelita leaped through the porthole, her pink tutu fluttering as if it were trying to escape, and joined Olaf on the table to begin a dance of triumph. C is for cute, Carmelita sang. A is for adorable. R is for ravishing. M is for go- Now, now, Carmelita. Count Olaf said, giving the tap-dancing ballerina fairy princess veterinarian a tense smile. Why don't you save your dance recital for later? I'll buy you all the dance costumes in the world. With VFD out of the way, all the fortunes of the world can be mine. <clears throat> the Baudelaire fortune, the Quagmire fortune, the Wittershins fortune, the- Where's Fiona? Klaus asked, interrupting the villain. What have you done with her? If you've hurt her- Hurt her? Count Olaf said, his eyes shining bright beneath his one scraggly eyebrow. Hurt triangle eyes? Why would I hurt a clever girl like that? Tee hee troop member. With one of his tiresome dramatic gestures, Count Olaf pointed behind him, and Esme clapped the tentacles of her outfit as two people appeared in the porthole. One was the hook-handed man who looked as wicked as he ever had, and the other was Fiona who looked slightly different. One difference was the expression on her face which looked resigned a f word which here means as if the mycologist had given up entirely on defeating Count Olaf. But the other difference was printed on the slippery-looking uniform she was wearing right in the center. No, Klaus said quietly as he stared at his friend. No, Violet said firmly and looked at Klaus. No, Sunny said angrily and bared her teeth as Fiona stepped through the porthole and stood beside Count Olaf on the wooden table. Her boot brushed against the poetry books Violet and Klaus had taken from the sideboard, including books by Lewis Carroll and T.S. Eliot. There are some who say that the poetry of Lewis Carroll is too whimsical, a word which here means full of comic nonsense, and other people complain that T.S. Eliot's poetry is too opaque, which refers to someone that, something that is unnecessarily complicated. But while everyone may not agree on the poets represented on the wooden table— Every noble reader in the world agrees that the poet represented on Fiona's uniform was a writer of limited skill who wrote awkward, tedious poetry on hopelessly sentimental topics. Yes, Fiona said quietly, and the Baudelaire orphans looked up at the portrait of Edgar Guest smiling on the front of her uniform and felt the tables turn once more. It's the end of chapter 12. Is it a bad combination to be driving at 4 a.m. watching Twitch chat? Yes! And not to mention that's not only unsafe, but illegal. <laughs> I do not recommend. Hey, Heartless Shroom, how are you? Aw. Hopefully you'll catch Kerr next time. <laughs> Can we just mark notes it? 
Your girl bad news. My mountain boyfriend's all good. <laughs> My favorite T.S. Eliot line. You're having a change? Fiona, how dare! Welcome home, Paige. All I'm learning is that Snicket really didn't like Edgar Guest. Yeah. Thank you for the claps. We have only one chapter left to the end of this book. It's gonna be a long one. It's like... 40 pages. But we're going to finish up this book here. We're making good time, so I'm not feeling quite as rushed and impressed as I thought I was going to be. Have to be at work in less than two hours. Blech. But tomorrow is Best Wednesday, and we're going to play some Nancy Drew. Nancy Drew. I don't know where that song came from. It sounded like a Carmelita song. I'm sorry. <clears throat> All right. Gosh, this is really good. This is some toasted graham coffee again. I know I need to relax on my work excitement. <clears throat> okay. Chapter 13. The water cycle consists of three phenomena. Evaporation, precipitation, and collection. And collection, the third of these phenomena, is the third of these phenomena that generally make up what is known as the water cycle. This phenomena, known as collection, is the process of gathering of water in the oceans, lakes, rivers, ponds, reservoirs, and puddles of the world, so that it will eventually go through the phenomena of evaporation and precipitation, thus beginning the water cycle all over again. It is a tedious thing for a reader to find in a book, of course, and I hope that my description of the water cycle has bored you enough that you will put this book down long ago and will not read chapter 13 of the Grim Grotto any more than the Baudelaire orphans will ever read chapter 39 of Mushroom Minute, no matter how crucial such a chapter may be. But, however tedious the water cycle is to readers, it must be very tedious indeed to the drops of water who must participate in this cycle over and over again. Occasionally, when I pause while writing my chronicle of the Baudelaire orphans and my eyes and back turn upward from my desk to look at the evening sky, the purple color of which explains the expression, the violet hour, I imagine myself as a drop of water, especially if it is raining or if my desk is floating in a reservoir. I think of how ghastly it would feel to be yanked away from my comrades when we were gathered in a lake or puddle and forced into the sky through the process of evaporation. I think how terrible it would feel to be chased out of a cloud by the process of precipitation and tumble to the earth like a sugar bowl. And I think of how heartbroken I would feel to gather once more in a body of water and feel during the process of collection that I had reached the last safe place, only to have the tables turn and evaporate into the sky once more as the tedious cycle started all over again. It is awful to contemplate this sort of life, in which one would always be forced into motion by a variety of mysterious and powerful forces, never staying anywhere for long, never finding a safe place one could call home, never able to turn the tables for very long, just as the Baudelaire orphans found it awful to contemplate their own lives as Fiona betrayed them, as so many of their companions had betrayed them before, just when it seemed they might break out of the tedious cycle of unfortunate events in which they found themselves trapped. Tell them, Triangle Eyes, Count Olaf said with a wicked smile. Tell the Baudelaire's that you've joined up with me. It's true, Fiona said, but behind her triangular glasses, her eyes were downcast, a word which here means looking sadly at the floor. Count Olaf said that if I helped him destroy the last safe place, he'd help me find my stepfather. But Count Olaf and your stepfather are enemies, Violet cried. They're on opposite sides of the schism. I wouldn't be so sure about that. Esme Squalor said, her suction cups dragging along the floor as she dr stepped through the broken porthole. After all, Captain Wittershins abandoned you. Maybe he's decided volunteers are out and we're in. My brother, my stepfather, and I could be together again, Fiona said quietly. Don't you understand, Baudelaire? Of course they don't understand, Count Olaf cried. Ha ha, halfwits. Those brats spend their lives reading books instead of chasing after fortunes. Now let's remove all the valuables from the Queequeg and we'll lock the orphans up in the brig. You won't get away from us this time, 
the hook-handed man said, taking the tagliatelle grande from behind his back and whirling the noodle, the noodle in the air. We didn't get away from you last time, Klaus said. You helped us sneak over here to save Sunny. You said you wanted to come with us when we escaped in the Queequeg and joined VFD at the last safe place. VFD, the hook-handed man sneered. With one scornful flick of his hook, he popped one of the balloons Phil had used to decorate the main hall for Violet's birthday. All those silly volunteers with their precious libraries and complicated codes. They're fools, every last one of them. I don't want to sit around reading idiotic books. He who hesitates is lost. Or she, Fiona said. I. Yes, Count Olaf said. Let's not hesitate a moment longer, Hooky. Let's tour this submarine and steal anything we want. I want to come too, Esme said. I need a new fashionable outfit. Of course, boss, the hook-handed man said, walking toward the door of the main hall. Follow me. No, you follow me, Count Olaf said, pushing ahead of him. I'm in charge. But, Countie, Carmelita whined, jumping off the wooden table and twirling around awkwardly. I want to go first because I'm a tap-dancing ballerina fairy princess veterinarian. Of course you get to go first, precious, Esme said. You get whatever your adorable little heart desires, right, Olaf? I guess so, okay, Olaf muttered. And tell Triangle Eyes to stay here and guard the orphans, Carmelita said. I don't want her to take all the good stuff for herself. Guard the orphans, Triangle Eyes, Count Olaf said. Although I don't think you orphans really need to be guarded. After all, there's nowhere for you to go, teehee traction. Giggle, giggle, gaudy, Carmelita cried, leading the way out of the main hall. Ha ha, hair trigger, Esme screamed, following her. Teehee tonsillectomy, Count Olaf shrieked, walking behind his girlfriend. I also find this amusing, the hook-handed man yelled and slammed the door behind him, leaving the Baudelaire's alone with Fiona. Traitor, Sunny said. Sunny's right, Violet said. Don't do this, Fiona. There's still time to change your mind and stay on the noble side of the schism. We received a volunteer factual dispatch, Klaus said, holding up the telegram. VFD's in desperate need of our services for a most urgent matter. We're meeting the volunteers at Briny Beach. You could come with us, Fiona. Green Hut. Sunny cried. She meant something like, you could be of enormous help, but Fiona didn't even wait for a translation. You wouldn't abandon your sister, the mycologist said. Ah, you risked your lives to save Sunny. How can you ask me to abandon my brother? Your brother is a wicked person, Violet said. People aren't either wicked or noble, Fiona said. They're like chef salads. Klaus picked up the photograph from the table and handed it to Fiona. This doesn't look like a chef salad to me, he said. This looks like a family. Is this what your family would have you do, Fiona? Send three children to the brig while you help a villain in his treacherous schemes? Fiona looked at the picture and then blinked back tears behind her triangular glasses. My family is lost, she said. I, my mother, is dead. My father moved away. I, my stepfather, has abandoned me. Aye, my brother may not be as wonderful as you Baudelaire's, but he is the only family I have. I'm staying with him. Aye. Stay with him if you must, Violet said, but let us go. Rendezvous, Sunny said. Take us to Briny Beach, Klaus translated. We might be on opposite sides of the schism, Fiona, but that doesn't mean we can't help one another. Fiona sighed and looked first at the Baudelaire's and then at the photograph of her family. I could turn my back, she said, instead of godding you. And we could take the Queequeg, Violet said, and escape. Fiona frowned and put the photograph back down on the table. If I let you go to Briny Beach, she said, what will you do for me? I'll teach you how to repair submarines, Violet said, gesturing to the telegram device. You could restore the Queequeg to its former glory. I don't need the Queequeg anymore, Fiona said. I'm part of the crew of the Carmelita. I'll give you my commonplace book. Klaus said, holding out his dark blue notebook. It's full of secrets. Count Olaf knows more secrets than you'll ever learn, Fiona replied. Hmm. The, sunny look the children looked down and saw Sunny, who had slipped away while the others were talking and was now walking unsteadily back through the door marked kitchen, dragging her diving helmet. Don't touch that, Sunny, Violet cried. There's a very dangerous fungus in there and we don't have any more antidote. My colo, Sunny said and lay the helmet at Fiona's feet. Sonny's right, Klaus said, looking at the helmet and shuddering. Inside that helmet is the bugaboo of the mycological pantheon, the medusoid mycelium. I thought you destroyed it, 
Fiona said. No, Violet said. The medusoid mycelium grows best in an enclosed space. You said that the poison of a deadly fungus can be the source of wonderful medicines. This is a very valuable specimen for a mycologist like yourself. That is true, Fiona admitted quietly and looked down at the helmet. The Baudelaire's looked down too, remembering their terrible journey through the grotto. They remembered how cold and dark it was when they left the Queequeg and drifted through the cavern, and the horrifying sight of the medusoid mycelium trapping them in an eerie cave until the stalks and caps waned away. They remembered their chilly journey back to the submarine and the dreadful discoveries of the missing crew and the mushrooms sprouting inside Sonny's helmet and the image of the octopus submarine on the sonar screen and the villain who was waiting for them when they tumbled inside. We're back, Count Olaf announced, bursting back into the main hall with his comrades behind him. Esme and Carmelita were peeking into a small shiny box and the hook-handed man was staggering under the weight of the uniforms and diving helmets he was carrying. There wasn't much to steal, I'm afraid. This submarine is not quite up to its former glory. Still, I found a small jewelry box hidden in the barracks with a few very valuable items. I think the ruby ring is very in, Esme purred. It would look wonderful with my flame-imitating dress. That was my mother's, Fiona said quietly. She would have wanted me to have it, Esme said quickly. We were close friends at school. I want the necklace, Carmelita demanded. It goes perfectly with my veterinarian stethoscope. Give it to me, County. I wish we had those carnival freaks with us, the hook-handed man said. They could help carry some of these uniforms. We'll see them at we'll see them at the Hotel Denouement, Count Olaf said, along with the rest of my comrades. Well, let's get out of here. We have lots to do before we arrive. Triangle eyes, take the orphans to the brig. Ha ha hula dance. Humming a ridiculous tune, the villain performed a few dance steps of triumph, only to stumble over the diving helmet on the floor. Carmelita giggled nastily as Olaf reached down and rubbed his tattooed angle. Ha ha, county, cried Carmelita. My dancer's idol was better than yours. Get this hat out of here, triangle eyes, Count Olaf snarled. He bent down, picked up the helmet, and started to hand it to Fiona, but the hook-handed man stopped him. I think you'll want that helmet for yourself, boss, the henchman said. I prefer smaller, lighter hats, Count Olaf said, but I appreciate the gesture. What my brother means, Fiona explained, is that inside this helmet is the medusoid mycelium. The Baudelaire's gasped and looked at one another in horror. As Count Olaf peered through the helmet's tiny window, his eyes wide beneath his eyebrows. The medusoid mycelium, he murmured, and ran his tongue thoughtfully along his teeth. Could it be? Impossible, Esme Squalor said. That fungus was destroyed long ago. They brought it with them, the hook-handed man said. That's why the baby was so sick. This is marvelous, Olaf said, his voice as raspy and wheezy as if he were poisoned himself. As soon as you Baudelaire's are in the brig, I'm going to open this helmet and toss it inside. You'll suffer as I've always wanted you to suffer. That is not what we should do, Fiona cried. That's a very valuable specimen. Esme stepped forward and draped two of her tentacles around Olaf's neck. Triangle eyes is right, she said. You don't want to waste the fungus on the orphans. Besides, you need one of them alive to get the fortune. That's true, Olaf agreed. But the idea of those orphans not being able to breathe is awfully attractive. But think of the fortunes we can steal, Esme said. Think of the people we could boss around with the medusoid mycelium in our grasp. Who could stop us now? No one, Count Olaf cackled in triumph. Ha, hoonin chicken. Ha, ha. Hamantashen, ha ha hors d'oeuvres, ha ha ha. But the Baudelaire children never learned what ridiculous word Olaf was going to utter next, as he interrupted himself to point across the main hall at a screen in the wall. The screen looked like a piece of graph paper lit up in green light, and at the center were both a glowing letter Q, representing the Queequeg, and a glowing I, representing the terrible octopus, octopus submarine that had devoured them. But at the top of the screen was another shape, one they had almost forgotten about. It was a long, curved tube with a small circle at the end of it, slithering slowly down the screen like a snake, or an enormous question mark, or some terrible evil the children could not even imagine. "'What's that cake-sniffing shape?' asked Carmelita. "'It looks like a big comma!' "'Shh!' Count Olaf hissed, putting his filthy hand over Carmelita's mouth. "'Silence, everyone!' "'We have to get out of here,' Esme mur murmured." This octopus is no match for that thing. You're right, Count Olaf muttered. Esme, go whip our rowers so they'll go faster. 
Hooky stored the uniforms. Triangle eyes take the orphans to the brig. What about me? Carmelita asked. I'm the cutest. I should get to do something. I guess you'd better come with me, the Count said wearily. But no tap dancing. We don't want to show up on their sonar. Ta-ta, cake sniffers, Carmelita said, waving her pink wand at the three siblings. You're so stylish, darling, as may said. It's like I always say, you can't be too rich or too in. The two wicked females jumped through the broken porthole and out of the Queequeg, followed by the hook-handed man who gave the Baudelaire's an awkward wave. But before Count Olaf exited, he paused, standing on the wooden table and drew his long, sharp sword to point at the children. Your luck is over at last, he said in a terrible voice. For far too long you keep defeating my plans and escaping from my clutches. A happy cycle for you orphans and an unprofitable one for me. But now the tables have turned, Baudelaire's, you finally run out of places to run. And as soon as we get away from that, he pointed at the sonar screen with a flick of his sword and raised his eyebrow menacingly, you'll see that this cycle has finally been broken. You should have given up a long time ago, orphans. I triumphed the moment you lost your family. We didn't lose our family, Violet said, only our parents. You'll lose everything, orphans, Count Olaf replied. Wait and see. Without another word, he leaped out of the porthole and disappeared into his ghastly mechanical octopus, leaving the Baudelaire's alone with Fiona. Are you going to take us to the brig? Klaus asked. No, Fiona asked. I, I'll let you escape, if you can. You'd better hurry. I can set a course, Violet said, and Klaus can read the title charts. Serve cake, Sunny said. Fiona smiled and looked around the main hall sadly. Take good care of the Queequeg, she said. I'll miss it, I. I'll miss you, Klaus said. Won't you come with us, Fiona? Now that Olaf has the Medusoid mycelium, we'll need all the help we can get. Don't you want to finish the submarine's mission? We never found the sugar bowl. We never found your stepfather. We never even finished that code we were going to invent. Fiona nodded sadly and walked to the wooden table. She picked up Mushroom Minute and then acted contrary to her personal philosophy, a phrase which here means hesitated for a moment and then faced the middle Baudelaire. When you think of me, she said quietly, think of a food you love very much. She leaned forward, kissed Klaus gently on the mouth, and disappeared through the porthole without so much as an eye. The, bre the three Baudelaire's listened to the mycologist's footsteps as she joined Count Olaf and his comrades and left them behind. She's gone, Klaus said as if he could hardly believe it himself. He lifted one trembling hand to his face as if Fiona had given him a slap instead of a kiss. How could she leave? He asked. She betrayed me. She betrayed all of us. How could someone so wonderful do something so terrible? I guess her brother was right, Violet said, putting her arm around her brother. People aren't either wicked or noble. Correctiona. Sonny said, which meant Fiona was right too, we'd better hurry if we want to escape from the Carmelita before Olaf notices we're not in the brig. I'll set a course for Briny Beach, Violet said. Klaus took one last look at the porthole where Fiona had disappeared and nodded. I'll look at the title charts, he said. Amnesi, Sonny said, she meant something along the lines of, you're forgetting something, and pointed one small finger at the circle of glass on the floor. Sonny's right, Klaus said, we can't launch the submarine without repairing the porthole or we're drowned. But Violet was already halfway up the rope ladder that led to the Queequeg's controls. You'll have to repair that yourself, Sonny, she called down. Cook, Sonny said. Cook in teeth. We don't have time to argue, Klaus said grimly, pointing at the sonar screen. The question mark was inching closer and closer to the glowing cue. Aye, Sonny said and hurried to the glass circle on the floor. It was still intact, but the youngest Baudelaire could think of nothing that could reattach the circle to the wall of the submarine. I think I found the location device, Violet called down from the Queequeg's controls. Quickly, she flipped a switch and waited impatiently as the screen came to life. It looks like we're 14 nautical miles southeast of the Gregorian Grotto. Does that help? Aye, Klaus said, running his finger over one of the charts. We need to travel straight north to Briny Beach. It shouldn't be that far. But how are we going to get out of the Carmelita? I guess we'll just fire up the engines, Violet said, and I'll try to steer us back through the tunnel. Have you ever steered a submarine before? Klaus asked nervously. Of course not, Violet said. We're in uncharted waters, aye? Aye, Klaus said and looked proudly up at his sister. The two Baudelaire's could not help grinning for just a moment before Violet pulled a large lever and the familiar whirring sound of the Queequeg's engines filled the main hall. 
Gangway! Sunny cried, squeezing past Klaus as she raced toward the kitchen. Violet and Klaus heard their sister fumbling around for a moment, and then the youngest Baudelaire returned, carrying two boxes the siblings recognized from their time in the town of Paltryville. Gum! she cried triumphantly, already ripping the wrappers off several pieces and sticking them into her mouth. Good idea, Sonny, Violet called. The gum can act as an adhesive and stick the porthole back together. That thing is getting closer, Klaus said, pointing to the sonar screen. We'd better get the submarine moving. Sonny can do the repair work while we move through the tunnel. I'll need your help, Klaus, Violet said. Stand at the porthole and let me know which way to turn, I. I, Klaus replied. I, Sonny cried, her mouth full of gum. The elder Baudelaire's remembered that their sibling had been too young for gum when the children were working at the lumber mill, and they could hardly believe she had grown up enough to be stuffing to be stuffing handfuls of the sticky substance into her mouth. Which way do I go? Violet called from the porthole. From the controls. Klaus peered out of the porthole. Right, he called back, and the Queequeg lurched to the right, traveling with difficulty in the little water at the bottom of the tunnel. There was enormous scraping sound, and the Baudelaire's heard a loud splashing from inside one of the pipes. I mean left, Klaus said quickly. You and I are facing opposite directions. Left. Aye, Violet cried, and the submarine lurched in the opposite direction. Through the porthole, the Baudelaire's could see that they were moving away from the platform where Olaf had first greeted them. Sunny spat a huge wad of gum onto the glass circle and spread it around with her hands on the circle's edge. Right, Klaus cried, and Violet turned the Queequeg again, narrowly missing a turn in the passageway. The eldest Baudelaire looked nervously at the sonar screen, where the sinister shape was moving closer and closer to them. Left, Klaus cried, left and down! The submarine lurched and sank, and through a porthole, the middle Baudelaire caught a gr brief glimpse of the rowing room, with Esme holding the Tagliatelle Grande threateningly in one fake tentacle. Sunny hurriedly stuffed more gum into her mouth, moving her enormous teeth furiously to soften the candy. Left again, Klaus said, and then a very sharp right when I say now. Now? Violet called back. No, Klaus said, and held up one hand as Sunny spit more gum onto the glass circle. Now! The submarine lurched violently to the right, sending several objects tumbling from the wooden table. Sunny ducked to avoid being knocked on the head by the poetry of T.S. Eliot. Sorry for the bumps, Violet called from the top of the rope ladder. I'm still getting the hang of these controls. What's next? Klaus peered out of the porthole. Keep going straight, he said, and we should exit the octopus. Help! Sunny cried, spreading the rest of the gum on the edge of the circle. Klaus hurried to her side and Violet raced down the rope ladder to help, leaving the submarine's controls alone so the Queequeg would travel in a straight line. Together, the three Baudelaire's picked up the glass circle and climbed onto the wooden table so they could put the porthole back together. I hope it holds, Violet said. If it doesn't, Klaus said, we'll know soon enough. On three, Sunny said, which meant something like, after I say one and two. One, do, three, the two, bo the through, the Baudelaire orphans said in unison, and pressed the glass circle against the hole Olaf had cut, smoothing the gum over the crack so that it might hold firm, just as the Queequeg tumbled out of the mechanical octopus onto the chilly waters of the ocean. The Baudelaire's pushed against the porthole together, their arms stretched out against the glass as if they were trying to keep someone from coming in a door. A few rivulets, a word which here means tiny streams of water, dripped through the gum, but Sunny hurriedly patted the sticky substance into place to stop the leaks. Her tiny hands smoothed the gum over the edge of the circle, making sure her handiwork was strong enough that the children wouldn't drown, but when she heard the siblings gasp, she looked up from her work, looked through the repaired porthole, and stared in amazement at what she saw. In the final analysis, a phrase which here means after much thought and some debate with my colleagues, Captain Wittershins was wrong about a great many things. He was wrong about his personal philosophy because there are plenty of times when one should hesitate. He was wrong about his wife's death as because, as Fiona suspected, Mrs. Wittershins did not die in a manatee accident. He was wrong to call Phil Cookie when it's more polite to call someone by their proper name, and he was wrong to abandon the Queequeg no matter what he heard from the woman who came to fetch him. Captain Wittershins was wrong to trust his stepson for so many years, and wrong to participate in the destruction of Anne Whistle Aquatics, and he was wrong to insist, as he did so many years ago, that a story in the Daily Punctilio was completely true, and to show this article to so many volunteers, including the Baudelaire parents, the Snicket siblings, and the woman I happened to love. But Captain Wittershins was right about one thing. He was right to say that there are secrets in this world too terrible for young people to know, for the simple reason that there are secrets in this world too terrible for anyone to know. Whether they are as young as Sonny Baudelaire or as old as Gregor Anwhistle, 
secrets so terrible that they ought to be kept secret, which is probably how the secrets became secrets in the first place, and one of those secrets is the long, strange shape the Baudelaire orphans saw. First on the Queequeg's sonar, and then as they held the porthole in place and stared out into the waters of the sea. Night had fallen. Monday night. So the view outside was very dark, and the Baudelaire's could scarcely see this enormous and sinister shape. They could not even tell, just as I will not tell, if it was some sort horrifying mechanical device, such as a submarine or a ghastly creature of the sea. They merely saw an enormous shadow uncurling and curling in the water, as if Count Olaf's one eyebrow had grown into an enormous beast that was roaming the sea, a shadow as chilling as the villain's glare and as dark as villainy itself. <clears throat> the Baudelaire orphans had never seen anything so utterly eerie, and they found themselves sitting still as statues, pressing against the porthole in an utter hush. It was probably this hush that saved them, for the sinister shape curled once more and began to fade into the blackness of the water. Shh, Violet said, although no one had spoken. It was the gentle, low shushing one might do to comfort a baby, crying in the middle of the night over whatever tragedy keeps babies awake in their cribs, and keeps the other members of the baby's family standing vigil, a phrase which here means keeping nearby to make sure everyone is safe. It does not really mean anything, this shushing sound, and yet the younger Baudelaire's did not ask their sister what she meant, and merely stood vigil with her, as the shape disappeared into the ocean of the night, and the children were safe once more. Without a word, Violet took her hands off the glass, climbed off the table, and resumed her place at the Queequeg's controls. For the rest of their journey, none of the children spoke, as if the unearthly spell of that terrible secret shape were still lingering over them. All night long and into the morning, Violet worked the levers and switches of the submarine to make sure it stayed on course, and Klaus marked their path on the charts to make sure they were heading to the right place, and Sunny served slices of Violet's birthday cake to her fellow volunteers, but none of the three Baudelaire's spoke until a gentle bump rocked the Queequeg, and the submarine came to a gentle stop. Violet climbed down the rope ladder and ducked underneath a pipe to peer through the periscope, just as Captain Wittershins must have peered at the Baudelaire's up in the Mortmain Mountains. We're here, she said, and the three Baudelaire's left the main hall and walked down the leaky corridor to the room where they had first climbed aboard the submarine. Valve? Sunny asked. We shouldn't have to activate the valve, Violet said. When I looked through the periscope, I saw Briny Beach, so we can simply climb up the ladder and end up where we were, Klaus finished, a long time ago. Without any further discussion, the Baudelaire children climbed up the ladder their steps echoing down the narrow passageway, until they reached the hatch. Violet grabbed the handle to open it and found that her siblings had each grabbed the handle too, so all three children turned the handle together and opened the hatch together, and together they climbed out of the passageway, down the outsides of the submarine, and lowered themselves onto the sand of Briny Beach. It was morning, the same time of morning as the last time the children had been there, receiving the dreadful news about the fire and it was just as gray and foggy as that terrible day. Violet even saw a slender smooth stone on the sand and picked it up just as she had done so long ago, skipping rocks into the water without ever imagining she would soon be exploring its terrible depths. The siblings blinked in the morning sun and felt as if some cycle were about to begin all over again, that once more they would receive terrible news and that once more they would be taken to a new home and only to have villainy surround them once more, as had happened so many times since their last visit to Briny Beach. Just as you might be wondering if the Baudelaire's miserable story will begin all over again for you, with my warning you that if you are looking for happy endings, you would be better off reading some other book. It is not a pleasant feeling to imagine that the tables will never turn and that a tedious cycle will begin all over again. And it made the Baudelaire's feel passive, just as they had in the waters of the stricken stream, accepting what was happening without doing anything about it as they looked around at the unchanged shore. Gack, Sunny said, which meant look at that mysterious figure emerging from the fog. And the Baudelaire's watched as a familiar shape stepped in front of them, took off a tall top hat, and coughed into a white handkerchief. Baudelaire's, Mr. Poe said when he was done coughing. Egad, I can't believe it! I can't believe you're here! You? Klaus asked, gazing at the banker in astonishment. You're the one we're supposed to meet? I guess so. Mr. Poe said, fr frowning and taking a crumpled piece of paper from his pocket. I received a message saying you'd be here at Briny Beach today. Who sent the message? Klaus asked. Mr. Poe coughed once more and then shrugged his shoulders wearily. The children noticed he looked quite a bit older than the last time they had seen him. Excuse me. 
and wondered how much older they looked themselves. The message is signed J.S., Mr. Poe said. I assume that it's that reporter from the Daily Punctilio, Geraldine Julian. How in the world did you get here? Where in the world have you been? I must admit, Baudelaire's I'd given up all hope of ever finding you again. It was a shame to think that the Baudelaire fortune would just sit in the bank gathering interest and dust. Well, never mind that now. You'd better come with me. My, pars my car is parked nearby. You have a great deal of explaining to do. No, Violet said. No, Mr. Poe said in amazement and coughed violently into his handkerchief. Of course you do. You've been missing for a very long time, children. It was very inconsiderate of you to run away without telling me where you were, particularly when you've been accused of murder, arson, kidnapping, and some assorted misdemeanors. We're going to get right in my car, and I will drive you to the police station, and... No, Violet said again, and reached into the pocket of her uniform. She held up the telegram to her siblings and read, At the pink hour, when the eyes and back turn upward from the desk, when the human engine waits, like a pony-throbbing party... That's what's in the telegram, she paused and scanned the horizon of the beach. Something caught her eye and she gave her siblings a faint smile. The real poem, she said, goes like this. At the violet hour, when the eyes and back turn upward from the desk, when the human engine waits, like a taxi throbby, wait, throbbing waiting. First fluctuation declaration, Klaus said. Code, Sonny said. What are you talking about? Mr. Poe demanded. What is going on? The missing words Violet said to her siblings as if the coughing baker had not spoken are Violet, taxi, and waiting. We're not supposed to go with Mr. Poe. We're supposed to get into a taxi. She pointed across the beach and the children could see, scarcely visible in a fog, a yellow car parked at a nearby curb. The Baudelaire's nodded and Violet turned to address the banker at last. We can't go with you, Violet said. There's something else we need to do. Don't be absurd! Mr. Poe sputtered. I don't know where you've been or how you got here or why you're wearing a picture of Santa Claus on your shirts, but it's Herman Melville, Klaus said. Goodbye, Mr. Poe. You are coming with me, young man, Mr. Poe ordered. Sayonara, Sonny said, and the three Baudelaire's walked quickly across the beach, leaving the banker coughing in astonishment. Wait, he ordered when he put his handkerchief away. Come back here, Baudelaire's, your children, your youngsters, your orphans. Mr. Poe's voice grew fainter and fainter as the children made their way across the sand. What do you think the word violet means? Klaus murmured to his sister. The taxi isn't purple. More, more code? Sonny guessed. Maybe, Violet said, or maybe Quigley just wanted to write my name. Baudelaire's! Mr. Poe's voice was almost inaudible, as if the Baudelaire's had only dreamed he was there on the beach. Do you think he's in the taxi waiting for us? Klaus asked. I hope so, Violet said and broke into a run. Her siblings hurried behind her as she ran across the sand, her boots showering sand with each step. Quigley? She said quietly, almost to herself, and then she said it louder. Quigley? Quigley? At last the Baudelaire's reached the taxi, but the windows of the car were tinted, a word which here means darkened so the children could not see who was inside. Quigley? Violet asked and flung open the door, but the children's friend was not inside the taxi. In the driver's seat was a woman the Baudelaire's had never seen before. Dressed in a long black coat, buttoned all the way up to her chin. On her hands were a pair of white cotton gloves, and in her lap were two slim books, probably to keep her company while she waited. The company looks, the woman looked startled when the door opened, but when she spied the children, she nodded politely and gave them a very slight smile, as if she were not a stranger at all, but also not a friend. The smile she gave them was one you might give to an, an associate or another member of an organization to which you belong. Hello, Baudelaire's, she said and gave the children a small wave. Climb aboard. The Baudelaire's looked at one another cautiously. They knew, of course, that one should never get into the car of a stranger, but they also knew that such rules do not necessarily apply in taxis when the driver is almost always a stranger. Besides, when the woman had lifted her hand to wave, the children had spied the name of the books she had been reading to pass the time. There were two books of verse, The Walrus and the Carpenter and Other Poems by Lewis Carroll, and The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot. Perhaps if one of the books had been by Edgar Guest, the children might have turned around and run back to Mr. Poe, but it is rare in this world to find someone who appreciates good poetry, and the children allowed themselves to hesitate. Who are you? Violet asked finally. The woman blinked and then gave the children her slight smile once more, as if she had expected the Baudelaire's to answer that question themselves. I'm Kit Snicket, she said, and the Baudelaire orphans climbed aboard, turning the tables of their lives and breaking their unfortunate cycle for the very first time. 
that is the end of the book. Here's a picture for you. All right, let me catch up and then we'll read the preview for the next. <laughs> Skip class in favor of best friends. Terry, my first class. My Twitch on my commuter isn't working. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's very dangerous, Arox. I would not recommend. So it's easily skippable for Indy with V and Holland being the first class and all. <laughs> first in-person graduate class. I mean, it is important. I want you to go to class. That girl is something else. She may be something else, but V is still fun to hang out with. Definitely what you meant. Hammer time. Hi, Hammer. Blood family is not family if they treat you like crap. This is true. It's a hard not like knock life for Fiona. Fiona's just never happy with anything offered to her. It's lucky charms time. Woohoo! Oh, I hope if you're already gone for PT that PT goes well. That feeling when you have to mute the stream because you don't want spoilers. Aw, I'm sorry. Hey, Rachel, if you're still here, thank you for being here. Thank you for shouting out, Rachel. Just being one put me on the up and up again. When you said, glad you're on the up and up, that made me think of that, Paige. Oh, I finally got almost everything set up to my satisfaction. Aw, oh, sorry about the missing CDs. Oh, and thank you for the host hammer. Have a good one, Caden. Captain Wrong. I don't know if I agree with his secrets philosophy. That's fair. Shush, Mr. Poet. Taxi time. Okay, be safe driving. Okay, thank you for the claps. All right, well, I'll read the uh, preview. And uh, then we'll call it. So here's what the preview looks like. And there's actually multiple pages of preview. So they're all ripped, which is why this is going to sound kind of weird. To my kind editor, my enemies I fear are with extremely long finger so that you might never re Lousy Lane ends in a colda. Gas station attendant with the complete manuscript anywhere near a match. Remember, you are my last be told to the general public. With all due respect, Lemony Snicket. Second one. To my kind, I must Apollo completely in, but I doubt it. Instead of drip field of daisies, if you dig straight, book the 12th. Remember, you are be told to the general with all due respect, Lemony Snicket. Number three, to my kind editor, I must once again, third times the, without anyone rip, the alleyway behind, an excellent hiding, the dreadful story, do not use the edit, remember you are, be told to the general, with all due respect, Lemony Snicket. Four. <clears throat> to my kind editor, how many apologies? Fourth times the continued treachery. One of the curviest, a cup of very bitter, the twelfth book. Remember, you are my, be told to the general. With all due respect, Lemony Snicket. To my kind editor, Please accept yet. This time I am sir impossible to dis The Galway Kennel barks the loudest. Chapter in his tit. Remember you are 
be told to the gen. With all due respect, Lemony Snicket. To my kind edit, the last safe laundry of title of the, her name, remember, with all. So those are the previews for book 12, which will be the next book we read in the Lemony Snicket series. Um, the next book I will be reading on stream, though, since I'm going back and forth, will be Nancy Drew Whispers in the Fog, which is the book that game number nine, Danger on Deception Island, is based off of. So that'll be the next book stream that we read. But then when we are done with that, we'll go back to book 12 of A Series of Unfortunate Events. So we only have two books left in A Series of Unfortunate Events. We're getting very close to the end, but I'm getting excited about it. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to go change clothes, eat a quick bite, and head to work. I hope you guys have a great rest of the day. Um, I'm doing good, Hammerman. Thank you. Don't want to go to work, but it is what it is. Um, I hope you guys have a great rest of the day today. Please take care of yourselves. As always, much love from me to you. I'll see y'all soon. Bye.